Let's give Jesus a hand all over the room tonight. And you can uh, find your seat tonight. And why don't you, uh, as you sit down, uh, tell the person next to you, you look good tonight. Happy good Friday. I tell them I waited all year since last Good Friday, hoping that I would get to sit next to you at Good Friday service at church. Hey, I, I want to uh, just welcome you to service tonight. And uh, you, should, you should have gotten some of these on your seat. Uh, and, and I wanna just challenge you to pray over this and give it to a neighbor, give it to a friend, invite them to church, tell them you'll buy them a coffee, you'll buy them lunch, whatever, whatever bribery it takes to get them to church on a Sunday morning and you'll save them a seat. Uh, you'll even pray over them, anoint them with oil, even massage their back during church. No, that'd be weird. Um, but hey, just want to uh, we're, we're just want to say it's it's Good Friday. Uh, we're taking a moment uh, to remember Jesus tonight, and I uh, want to also welcome people that are watching online with us. And uh, I heard one person say that it's not just it's not just Good Friday, but it's God's Friday. Uh, it's a it's it's a day that it it went down God's way. It was His plan, and and Jesus was not Plan B. He wasn't Plan C. He was always the plan. He was Plan A as the Savior of the world, and. Uh, if you remember this past Sunday, if you were with us, we looked at uh, Palm Sunday, and we celebrated that, and we celebrated what, what, what would be the arrival of the King, the arrival of the uh, Messiah happening at the beginning of this week that we're in right now, a little over 2,000 years ago, and uh, what we saw is that we serve a King that keeps his promises. We serve a King that uh, he heals and restores. We serve a King that loves his People. We serve a king that brings hope to our world and change to people's lives and, and something new in people's lives. And I believe that he's gonna continue to do that in our world uh, even tonight and in, in this weekend. And so uh, we serve a king as well that does the unexpected. How many are thankful that we serve a God that does the unexpected? And, you know, people 2,000 years ago, they were expecting the Messiah. They were expecting the anointed one. They were praying and thinking and, and wondering when it was gonna happen. And they see this moment for many of, his, of Jesus' followers where they're like, man, it's time. He's here. The anointed one has come. But what they thought is that he was coming in to overthrow Rome. They thought that it was, it was a lot smaller uh, than the mission that Jesus was actually there for. And how many people are thankful that it was a little bit bigger than that? It was a worldwide rescue mission for all people, for all time, so that anybody could be saved. And so we go from last Sunday to this Friday and this week of Holy Week, Passion Week. And uh, what, we, what we've seen throughout this week is this moment where Jesus comes into Jerusalem and then the next day he clears out the temple and he, and he continues to teach a little bit through this week and he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the religious leaders and the people uh, in Jerusalem and, and he spends these moments imparting some of his final teachings and wisdom and, and then we see Judas betray him and take money for this betrayal and, and we see this last supper that, that would have been last night with his disciples where he celebrates what, what we now call communion and, uh, and then we see this moment where Jesus is arrested in the garden of Gethsemane under the cover of night. Why was it under the cover of night? Because I think that the priests and some of the people that hated him would have known the uproar that it would have caused if they did it in broad daylight because Jesus was popular. <laughs> people knew this. there's something special about this guy, he's anointed. And they, they come across this valley with their torches to arrest Jesus. And then ultimately, uh, he gets turned over to Pilate and turned over to the Roman soldiers. And we see this moment where he's crucified. And that's what we remember today, that Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, the God-man who in this moment could have called down angels to save him, he is nailed to a cross and he gave himself up to die. And I'd like to tonight go through some of the scripture as we remember this day that happened so long ago. And I'd like to start with a, a text in Isaiah. And as we read this, I just wanna challenge you uh, to consider this, consider these words and consider uh, how it might challenge you and encourage you and impact you in your life and remind you ultimately of what Jesus did for all of us individually. So I wanna start in this text in Isaiah. And, and if you didn't know, this was written 700 years or more uh, before it actually happened. It's crazy to think like s seven great grandparents ago, that's, that's, the, that's the time span that, that went by before this actually happens. In Isaiah 53, it says this, verse three, 
It says he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. It says in verse four, surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. By his wounds we're saved. By his wounds we have hope for the future. By his wounds he brings healing to our bodies, yes, now and someday fully in the future. By his wounds we have peace. By his wounds we have hope for the future and salvation. That's the king that we remember tonight, and what was expected, what was unexpected by so many people happened on this day so long ago and happened to the one that they thought was the Messiah. And the Jews in this, in this moment in time, they didn't have a full understanding of what was happening right before their eyes. They didn't, they didn't get what was really going on. And, and I'd like to just tonight encourage you and remind you a few things about our king, remember Jesus is our king. He's the king above all kings, the Lord of all lords. Anybody thankful that there is no king that's as powerful as him? And so the, the, the first thing that I'd like to just remind you, maybe, maybe encourage you with, is that the king's death teaches us faith over our circumstances. Through this whole situation, Jesus, he, he demonstrated faith over circumstance. He demonstrated a faith over what was happening in his life. He demonstrated a faith over the pain that he was gonna go through, the emotional agony of that moment. He demonstrated faith, and many of us know the words in scripture where God says, I will never leave you or forsake you, but a lot of us would probably admit tonight that there are moments that we don't always feel like that. We don't always feel like he's with us, and in a broken world, in a world that's sin-ridden in a world that, that people make choices that affect us in a negative way, in a world where there's just messed up stuff that happens, there are moments that all of us feel alone and feel maybe forgotten. Jesus shows us, though, that even in those moments, we can have faith, that we can have faith in God's plan, that we can have faith that the Holy Spirit is with us as our guide, as our empowerer, as our leader, as our comforter in every moment of life. Jesus shows us faith even when we feel alone. I would, I would just encourage you that in the moments when, when you feel alone, when you feel like you don't know where to turn, when you feel like maybe he's forgotten you, when you feel like your back is against the wall, remember that his back was against a cross for you. So tonight I wanna look at the moment right before Jesus is arrested just after the Last Supper as well. In Matthew 26, verse 36, it says this, Jesus went with them his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death, remain here and watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. I wonder how many of our prayers sound like that on a daily basis. God, not, not my will, but your will. Jesus, fully God, yet still fully man in this moment, he knows the pain that he's about to go through. He knows the rejection, he knows the mocking, he knows the words that are gonna be spoken, he knows the physical pain, he knows death is on the way, and it's become so real in this moment that, that, that he has a moment with the Father where he's saying, God, may, Father, maybe there's another way. Maybe, there, maybe you could let this cup pass through, maybe, God, is there another way? And in many, many uh, historians and scholars, they would point out the reality that as he's in this garden on this hillside, he would have seen in the distance the torches coming to arrest him. And in that moment, he could have gone over the hill into the wilderness, never to be found again. There was an escape route, yet he sits there and he has faith above his circumstance, above what's happening. He demonstrates that, and, and I believe that we, because of that, can walk in faith in our lives today. Luke's account of this same moment, it gives us some different details. 
It says that when he withdrew from them about a stone's throw away, he knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, not my will, your will. It says there appeared an angel from heaven strengthening him. I believe that in moments in our lives, there is, there is angels around us. The Holy Spirit is with us. When we go through moments like Jesus did where it feels like there's nowhere else to turn, that there is a God that cares so much about you that he says, I'm gonna strengthen you and encourage you if you would let me be a part of your life and in your heart, I am with you. It says it strengthened him and and it says in verse 44 of Luke chapter 22, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like, became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. There's literally a thing that we call hematohydrosis where people sweat blood and that's what's going on with Jesus in this moment. He's literally sweating blood and the stress and the agony and the pain knowing what's gonna happen. He knows what's coming, yet he still gives himself up and sees these people coming and says, I'm gonna do my Father's will. Because he had such faith in the Father's plan. He didn't care about the circumstance. He, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let your will be done in this moment. Faith over the surrounding events, the emotion, all of what was happening. And we see Jesus, once, once he is on the cross that next day, that he makes statements and he fulfills Old Testament prophecy and, and, and makes statements from, from the old prophecies. And he says things like, God, why have you forsaken me? And Father, into your hands, I, I, I commend my spirit. Death in that moment, death was still death, even for Jesus. And the fear and the pain and the details that he had to go through, he demonstrated such great faith so that we can walk in faith in the circumstances of our life. You may be here today saying, God, I, 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 I may not understand the situation I'm in. I may, it, it might be so difficult. I don't know where, what else to do. I don't know where to turn, yet, yet I am going to trust you. I know you're working things out, God. I know that you have a plan. I know that you're a good father. I, I know that you're gonna restore. I know that even if it takes a long time, even if it's eternity, your word says that someday you will make all things new. No more pain, no more disease, no more hopelessness, no more war. war. He's gonna make all things new. He's gonna fulfill his promises. The king is in the business of keeping his promises even when it looks like nothing can be done. He's gonna keep his promises in your life. So we can have faith like Jesus and we see Jesus go from the garden and go from this moment of being arrested and, and, and the high priests and the council, they, they take him to this home where the high priest is at and, and the scripture tells us that they actually spit in his face, that many of them slapped him, that they mocked him and they threw him in a pit overnight. Then in the morning, they bring him to Pilate and they turn him over to the Romans and they want him to be put to death. And I want you to remember this also. The second thing tonight is that the king died so that you don't have to. The reality is, is that all of us, every single one of us, no matter who we are, we all deserve death. And, and some people might say, well, what do you mean? I'm a pretty good guy. Like my grandpa was terrible, but, but I'm better than him. You know, that I'm, I'm better than, the, than my neighbor over there that really treats people in a bad way. I got a decent family. I even put money in the plate at church sometimes. I, I'm, I'm an okay guy. What do you mean by that? The Bible says that all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Every person has missed the mark and made a mistake, told a lie, treated someone bad, stole some. Every person is messed up. And the good news, the gospel, which means good news, it's not good unless we understand how badly we need it. All of us are born into a sin nature. All of us are born on team Adam, team sin, team I made a mistake, team missing the mark, separated from a holy God, the creator of the universe, the Lord, the king of kings, the perfect one, without blemish, the, the righteous and the just judge. All of us are separated from him by our sin. And here's the thing about a just judge tonight is if, if you've maybe ever been in court, a just judge, a good judge, man, they have to be fair. They have to administer justice. They have to do what's right. And so the father looked at his creation. He says, man, something has to be done about the sin problem. Something has to be done about the problem that humanity is going to be separated from me for all time. And so he 
makes the decision, Jesus, the plan, plan A, because the father, w- w- he could have wiped us out. He could have said, man, I'm giving up. <laughs> I, I, I don't care anymore. I'm, I, I he could have said, never mind. He could have said, I'm gonna leave humanity separated forever from relationship with me, but out of his great love, he made the first move. He made the needed move. He he did the completed work to save any and all people that would come to him. He gave us a choice. Most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. He didn't just love. He didn't just say, I love you, I love you, I love you. He gave He said, I'm gonna do something about the problem. I'm gonna give my son to be the perfect sacrifice. Romans 5, 8 tells us this. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still making mistakes, while we were still spitting in his face by our actions, while we were still missing the mark, Christ died for us. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, Jesus took the sin of the world on his back. He literally became sin so that when the Father now looks at you, if you accept him, he doesn't see your past. He doesn't see your mistakes. He doesn't see the moments that you messed up. He doesn't see the person that you mistreated. He doesn't see the jail time that you served. He doesn't see all of the things that you did. He sees right righteousness. He sees, he sees a person that is now right in his eyes and, and, and can have relationship with him. That's what he sees. The, the perfect sacrifice, the, the only way, he, he, he put the sin of every individual purpose on him, every individual person on him, because our God is just, there, there had to be a substitute. What did, what, what did Isaiah 53 say? It said he took our pain, he bore our suffering, what we deserve, he took that upon himself. It's interesting, I, I read an article this past week about some people in China and there was this news that, that kind of broke and they wrote this article where the extremely rich people in China can avoid prison time and can avoid uh, punishment by hiring body doubles. And the story, it originally broke with one instance where uh, this super rich person, this, this 20-year-old guy named Hu, H-U, he was drag racing his friends and, and he hit somebody and, and they lost their life. So he, he, was, he had to serve like a three-year prison, prison sentence, but what happened is he hired somebody to go to court and serve the time that he owed. And there was another case that a, of a guy who owned a demolition company and he took down a building that he wasn't supposed to Ill- illegally and he hired a guy and said, I'll pay you $31 a day to serve out my sentence in prison. In China, the, this practice, it's so common that the, there's even a term for it in the Chinese, but it basically it's substitute criminal. Today, that's the kind of thing that we would call scandalous, the kind of thing that we would call not right. But that's why we look back today to 2000 years ago and we call the grace of God scandalous. It's a scandalous grace that took our penalty, that became our substitute when we deserved death. He was the substitute for what we deserved. So we look at Jesus' trial that ended with Pilate and it was unfair and he gets turned over to be crucified even though he's innocent. And I wanna look at the details of what he went through tonight because it's powerful to think about. We, We can't just wash over the details of how horrendous it was what he went through. I just want you to remember tonight, the third thing is that the king's death proved his love for us. Proved his love for you, for me, for us, not not just corporately, but individually. He proved his love for you by what he did on the cross. And we often hear that love is an action, love is a verb. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight that the greatest action and the greatest action verb is Jesus' death on the cross for all of humanity. Mark 15 tells us this about the crucifixion Verse 22, it says, they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. It says, they offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes. They threw dice to decide who would get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. So after all that 
Jesus has gone through. He's been up all night. He's been beaten. He's been mocked. He's been spit on. They, they, they then beat him even more and make him carry his own cross to the place that he's going to be crucified and he gets weak and he can't make it so they grab a bystander and this guy helps him carry his cross and and, and they go to this place called Golgotha that would be right outside the city gates and in modern day it would be somewhere within the church the place we call the church of the holy sepulcher and he's crucified in this space and they offer him wine and myrrh and he refuses it why because he says I'm going to take the full weight of the sin of the world I'm going to I'm going to take everything that everybody did upon myself in this moment. And the Romans, when they offer him this, they're, they're, not, they're not saying, Here, here's some wine out of their own mercy. They're trying to make this crucifixion efficient because it would relax a person. It tells us that they nailed him up to the cross at 9 a.m. in the morning. And you know, many pictures that we see, it shows these nails that would go through his hands. But the reality is, is if it was in his hands, it would, it would tear through the skin and, and, and come out that way. And so they would, what they would have done, the, the Roman uh, people would have, would have taken the nails, these iron square, iron rot nails, long nails, and they would have taken it and found these little bones in the wrist right in the middle, and they would have taken it and put his hand upon the cross and nailed it in one hand, taken the other hand, nailed it in this long nail straight into the cross. They would, in that moment, not pull his arms too tight. They would, they would leave him kind of like this. And in this moment, they, they, they put this sign up on the post that said, Jesus, King of the Jews. And they would lift him up and take his feet, put his feet together and take a long nail and a hammer right through the arches of his feet and nail his feet into this cross. And that's what would be crucifixion. The victim is now crucified in that moment. And what would happen is Jesus, as he slowly would sag down, there'd be more weight on the nails that are in his wrists. And this excruciating pain would shoot through his fingers and up into his arms and explode into his brain. And it would put pressure on the median nerves and he would push himself upward to avoid the the stretching torment that was happening. And it would put place the full weight on the nails that are in his feet. There'd be even more agony of the, the nails tearing through those nerves between the, the bones of the feet and the arms would become fatigued and there's waves of cramps that would, that would sweep through his muscles and he would be fatigued and, and there's this throbbing pain and, and all of the, the muscles in here would be paralyzed and the, the air that he's trying to breathe would, would be drawn into the lungs but, but when you're crucified, it's hard to breathe it back out and, and carbon dioxide would begin to build up in his lungs and in the bloodstream and the pain excruciating, that, that word excruciating literally comes, the, the root of that is the cross. So if Jesus, is, as he hangs on the cross and moves up and down, as he's trying to breathe, his, his back is scraping that, that, that rugged wood, and there's a loss of tissue, and there's fluids that have reached a critical level and his compressed heart would have been struggling to pump heavy and thick and sluggish blood into the tissue and the lungs would be frantically trying to breathe and he's gasping for small gulps of air and the priests and the scribes imagine this are continuing to mock him while watching all of what he's going through. There's all these mixed emotions and there's these thoughts and the, the people that were following him are wondering what is going on. We didn't think this, I thought he was gonna clear out Rome. And then after hours of being on the cross, John tells us that the moment comes where Jesus says this. He says, it is finished. But you need to know tonight that he, said, he doesn't say it's finished out of defeat. He doesn't say it's finished out of loss, but he says it's finished out of victory because the work of what we deserved was now done by his work on the cross. So he would have bowed his head and he would have given up his spirit in that moment and the prophecy was fulfilled. The substitution was finished and what we owed, the 
debt that we had to pay, the, the death that we deserved, the prison sentence that we needed to have, all of that was finished. Last thing is you need to remember tonight that the king died, but Sunday is coming. Jesus, he said he would be back. <laughs> the disciples probably didn't believe him and they were afraid and they were confused and it was Friday and it was Saturday and they didn't know what to do and they're sitting probably hiding out during the Sabbath on Saturday, but, but, but they didn't know that the king died, but, but, but Sunday was coming, Sunday was on the way. Spoiler alert, he got up and he got out and he has risen. You know, before we celebrate Sunday too much, I think it's still important for us to remember tonight what he did. And I'd like to do that as a family. And the greatest way I think that we can do that is to take communion together. And so the ushers can prepare for that. And as we go into a moment of communion tonight, a moment of remembering, and Jesus told us to do this, a moment of remembering what he did for us, you don't have to be a member of Radiant to take communion with us tonight, but the Bible tells us that you do need to have a relationship with Jesus. And so tonight, I, I'm just gonna take a moment with, if, and if I could ask you with every head bowed, every eye closed all over the room, maybe you're in here tonight and you would say, man, I don't have a real relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're watching online tonight and you would say, I've walked away from Jesus. Maybe you. Maybe you came this evening and, and somebody <laughs> drug you to church and, and you would say, man, I don't know if my world ended tonight, if the world ended tonight it, it, and tomorrow is not promised, by the way, I don't know where I would be. I don't know if I would have hope for eternity. I don't know if I would be with Jesus. I don't know what it would look like. I don't know if I would be separated from God. Maybe, you, maybe you're in here and you've never made that decision. Maybe you're in here and you feel like, man, I have walked away, but tonight I wanna come back to Jesus. I wanna walk with him. I, I want my life to be changed. I want the hope that he offers. I want, I want to walk in that, that, that forgiveness of sin that he made available because of what he did on the cross. And so if you're in here tonight and you would say, I want to come back, I want to know him for the first time, I'm going to ask you if you would just slip up your hand. Anybody in the room tonight, I need Jesus. I want to walk with him. I need the hope that he has. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Anybody else? You can put it right back down. four or five people, anybody else in, in the room? Thank you, I see you in the back, I appreciate that. You can stay in your seat, I just wanna pray for you in a moment. Tonight, there is no greater night than tonight to come to Jesus. It's the greatest decision you could ever make. Anybody else, maybe you're online, you need to push the button, you need to type in the chat that says, I need Jesus, I'm making a decision. They'll give you next steps online, anybody else tonight? Thank you for watching the message today. I pray that God has touched your heart. If you want to rededicate your life to Jesus or you want to pray that prayer for the very first time, let me lead you in that prayer. You believe it with all your heart, you'll be saved. Pray something like this. Jesus, I love you. Thank you for what you did on the cross. I ask you to forgive my sin of unbelief, which has caused me to be separated from you. I never want to be separated again because today I believe. I believe, Jesus, that you're the Son of God, that God has raised you from the dead, and that I believe you're God himself. And I ask you to be the Lord of my life in every area. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm super proud of you. Great decision, most life-changing decision you'll ever make. And maybe at the bottom of the screen, you can go to the link to give you next steps, traction in your faith. We'd love to partner with you. Thanks for being part of the Radiant Church family. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shout upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you, give you peace in whatever you face. Remember, God loves you. I love you, this is home, and we're family. God is good all the time.